Lead the charge with Milwaukee. Performance, power, precision, no petrol hassles. Learn more at milwaukeetool.com.au. Milwaukee, nothing but heavy duty. Attention sports fans. Planning an overseas trip to catch your favorite games? Look no further than sports where I am. They've got it all. League schedules, trustworthy tickets, and over 200 cities to choose from, all conveniently on one website. Plus, as an Australian company, they know the importance of great customer service for those long-haul journeys. So visit sportswhereiam.com and start planning your dream sports trip today. Sports Where I Am, your ticket to an unforgettable sports travel experience. Righto, let's get into the show. I don't normally do too many introductions, mate, because no. it pops up with the King's name. So, mate, thank <laughs> you so much for jumping in. I know you've driven two and a half hours, peak hour traffic just to come see me. And, you know, Mr. September himself, to get you in September is not easy, apparently, but I didn't even think about it because you were you were too easy. Well, no, life, uh, life has been busy. And then, yeah, this September, I'm guessing, uh, you know, I've got a management group, TLA, that's looking after it, but uh, it's filling up quickly, just off the back of last year with the cats going so well. And then, um, yeah, mate, still a little bit at the storm. So, um, yeah, following and, and then obviously getting in there a little bit too. Yeah, I'm keen to get into um, everything you're doing at the moment and um, and tap into all the leadership stuff you're doing there. The boys have been speaking very fondly of you, obviously it's the Clubhouse boys. <laughs> um, mate, let's talk straight about the book, All In. Congratulations. I, I must say um, I was having a laugh to Jezza like the other week because I go, mate, what if you can't read or you can't? <laughs> so where, where can we find it as an audio as well? You can get it online as well, can't you? Yeah, no, well, the audio I got asked to do and – it was just like I just got back overseas and they literally want me for three days in doing the audio. And I'd read it three times already. So I was like, can we get someone else to do the audio just uh, for me? So it hasn't been put out in audio yet, but uh, there has been a few of the boys that have asked for it. So we'll, 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 um, we'll get onto that. But, but it was a good thing to do. Like I didn't think that I'd enjoy writing a book as much as I um, did. Um, sort of pushed back on it for a long time because I just didn't like the thought of having something on paper written. Um, and then people just sort of pull it apart and, um, you know, sort of read it their own way. Um, so I was a little bit nervous, but at the same time, mate, it was um, really good to do because it got to reflect. And I just didn't reflect much uh, mm. when I was playing footy. So I got to uh, just look back at all the good people that I work with mainly and uh, just reminded me to thank him along the way. How hard was it? Like, you know, obviously you've had an amazing career and a long one as well. And it's yeah. not, doesn't just start when you play AFL. It's obviously when you're growing up. So how long did it take you to actually like when you start at the first chapter, like how long does it st like take? Yeah. Well, it was probably about a nine, sort of eight to nine month, um, sort of, you know, program that we had. Um, I was really grateful that mum and dad kept scrapbooks from oh, junior big. days. So <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, the Bendigo 80 got a fair run. <laughs> um, and then along the way, you know, just memories of um, playing with guys at state levels and stuff like that. So um, I'm really grateful. I had a ghostwriter with Pete Ryan uh, help me out. Um, and Pete sort of, he didn't really want to do it. He's a sports journalist at the age and um, when I asked him, he said, mate, I don't do books. And uh, I said, well, I just won't do one then and sort of gave him <laughs> yeah, the guilt the trick. Cracker, yes. and, uh, and with that, he sort of jumped on board and he sort of knew the assignment too, like that I wanted it in my words, my way, um, which was pretty good. And so we started at the start, well, we started at the end with the grand final, the way that it finished um, and just the emotion of all that and then went back to the start from there. So does he interview you and then he's writing stuff down, notes, and then obviously he would start writing and you go, oh, I wouldn't say that, tweak that. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, he would have sat, we would have sat down probably nine to 10 times um, throughout a sort of over a period of sort of six months. And throughout that, you know, go off and um, interview those people in between, those uh, schoolmates and the, you know, ex-teammates or guys that I came up against. The um, So which was really, yeah, really good. Or people that I work with, like a, someone like a Neil Baum that's at Richmond now um, that was really sort of important in my career when I become a young captain to sort of look after me. 
that's uh, mate, it's special. As I said, I've um, I've read pages of it. Obviously, doing um, little bits of research for this one. I've only read about two books in my life. I, I, I got through mate, like a quarter of one. A mentor <laughs> gave me a book. I got like in a real good routine before bed, and then all of a sudden, it's just gone. I just can't get into mate, them. A lot of like we're all similar. Like I, I'm uh, very much the same. Like I have to be really in, or maybe on a holiday to yeah. get sort of stuck into one. But um, yeah, I just find that life's too fast. So uh, it's. It's been good. Like, it's been going off the shelves. We've got Father's Day coming up. That's awesome. Uh, So hopefully uh, there's some sales again for those uh, people that are late. Uh, in getting to Father's Day presents, there will be. And where do we buy, like? Where do we get them? All your good Mate, bookstores of everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And you know the line too well. But um, so Dimix, and then all like you can go through Kmart, Target, online um, as well. Yep, yep, yep. That's so that's beautiful. Which is good. Ah, uh, well done, mate. It's um, it's the dream. But honestly, yeah. And uh, also, like you know. All in, the name All In. Is that just because that just that's you? You were all in with everything you did, and also you did, uh, you know, you did say in an interview like you were all in with the book. Everything's out yep. there. You're the truth is for everything, not only just footy, but life and the struggles with you know trying to have a kid and all that yep. kind of stuff. It was just like an easy name to come up with, or did it take a while? No, well, it was in the end. Was sort of it's the last thing that you do is put sort of like the <laughs> title on the book, and uh, it took me back to when I retired and was doing the press conference with. Um, Chris Scott and Steve Hawking. And I sort of, I said at the time, I said, I could probably go at 85%, but you know, if I'm to do it, I had to be all in. And um, yeah, so it took me back to then. And then when we were writing the last bit of the book was about Brit and I um, trying to create a baby. um, I sort of took it to her and I said, well, look, this is, you know, that's a big part of the, what happened in the last few years of footy. Um, Do you want it to be in there or not? Because we could sort of, get around it, that it, it was just a footy book. And she goes, no, no, no. Like it was a big part of what was happening. So um, I thank her because to date back on that so recently on, um, so we we went through um, an IVF clinic down here. Um, she had uh, like double figure sort of transfers of an embryo, which is basically, um, you know, a crazy amount, but it's it's not for a competition with any other sort of IVF journey that anyone goes on, but it was more that we could give hope to maybe um, someone out there, you know, a group of people that have to go down those fertility, um, you know, pathways that you, you don't wish upon anyone, uh, mm. that you, when you get to see it, what the girls have to go through, uh, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, no, you're spot on. I saw Brit's lovely post as well when you had your Beautiful boy, Joey, born and the nice little message to all the, you know, the, um, you know, I guess the women out there trying to have kids and struggling. So it's uh, it's a beautiful message. And how is dad life? How's it going? I saw you've just, we'll talk about your travel and your trip away <laughs> in a second, but what's it like being your dad? Mate, it's so good. Um, so I wanted to um, play footy as a kid. Um, I wanted to run in the Olympics. I wanted to be a dad. So I've been able to tick two off. Uh, running the Olympics, <laughs> I, might be, uh, I might be in a bit of trouble, but um but he's so good. We're six months in now. Um, we t- Yeah, we took him overseas, uh, which was pretty brave. Uh, so at th- the three-month stage, took him overseas because uh, a part of uh, finishing up was to take a good break. Um, so uh, we spent two months over a European summer. Didn't quite bump into you, but... No, nah, um, I just missed you. I just missed you. <laughs> I, I was actually wondering too, Tommy, you sort of, did you only take across the hand luggage? Because it didn't look like there was too many shirts packed. <laughs> oh, mate, I've got a funny story, actually. I wanted to bring it up. Like, I've always had the sloppy rig, right? And the bo- and I was doing, I, I've told the boys this many a times, I was doing a lot of incline press. The nice. boys go, you need to do the incline. So one night, we uh, we, were, we were at Yacht Week, and it was the first night there, and I've got burnt as a crisp. Yep. I mean, mate stitched me up. Yep. He goes, don't wear sunscreen, man. You'd be sweet. That was the silliest thing I've ever, I've ever heard. Anyway, so I'm looking real tan and red and brown, and um, and then we jump in Yacht Week, and there's a couple of girls in the in the water, and, he, and he's wording them up, telling them to come up to me and tell me how good my chest's looking, right? <laughs> and I go, anyway, so I get getting all these compliments. Jeez, your chest looks good. And I go, Oh yeah, no, nah, I've been working on the incline, you know. And then, <laughs> and then, and then another one would come up to me like two hours later. Jeez, oh, you, you're so burnt. Like, oh, your chest looks in great nick. And I go, what's going on here in my head? And then that night, I go, you know what? Fuck it, I'm gonna wear this. I'm gonna undo this shirt. All night, I had the confidence to just have, you know, no buttons on, mate, so not good. no shirt. And then he told me two days later, he goes, mate, you know we were doing, mate. I go, yeah, oh, you're that. kidding. No. So yeah, there was mate, not much clothes. It. There was not much clothes. Just just your bodies on, and uh, yeah, your yacht week. Very different to um to your one. Which a little we, bit, yeah, yeah. But we um so we spent a little bit time down sort of the bottom of Spain, and then went across the south of France, and. 
up to London for a month because Britt wanted to go live overseas for a period of time. So the trade-off was to go on a big holiday, but uh, it's probably cost me more going on the holiday than uh, <laughs> oh, living over yeah, there. It's not cheap over there, mate. I'll <laughs> tell you what, I only went for three weeks. Jeez, it felt like I went for two months. <laughs> nah, it's crazy, but we, we had a great time. Ah, it's good. Yeah, I was the same. I'd never done a summer as well. I'd done a little bit of Europe um, at the end of like a footy season or yeah. I think when we got knocked out early. So. Um, but let's talk about that. You, 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 like you were working with the Australian cricket team. You did a bit of work with Jerry, Jerry, what's his last Jerry name? Ryan. Ryan, Jerry Ryan yeah. from the, um, Tour de France, Australian team. And talk to us about that experience. Cause I know that's well, a big bucket list for you. Yeah. Well, I wasn't, um, I wasn't so much working with them, but I was just enjoying sort of jumping on the coattails more than anything else. So Andrew McDonald, who coaches the Australian cricket side, um, lives down in Geelong and created a little bit of a relationship over a a long period of time where he's popped into the footy club when he's been coaching the Victorian sides and whatnot. Um, so he, when I was over there, he said, uh, if you wanted to you know, come along to training, feel free to. Went along to training, got thrown the top, got thrown the shorts, and, and I just looked like <laughs> I was one of the boys, so, <laughs> yeah. which was great. And uh, there's a couple of uh, good footy boys in there, um, you know, Hedy and Alex Carey that sort of loved the game. So, yeah, you know, Mod's a mad port man. Mad. Yeah. yeah. And so he was pretty keen to talk footy and uh, which was good. And that, so I spent sort of the first day at Lords um, watching on as a fan more than anything else. And then uh, the Tour de France was a little bit of um, help with Jerry. So he's a owner at uh, Melbourne Storm and um, he owns the cycling side um, that uh, is – an Australian-owned cycling side, basically. Um, a little bit of help now, which is good because he doesn't have to do it all himself, but yep. um, amazing experience. Um, you massive fan of the Tour de France? No, not really, mate. Was that was when I got suspended one year, um, four, four matches for – I was innocent at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it was about 2013, and uh, I got sent over to Perth to do a training camp, and I took uh, – sorry, it was 2011. I got sent over there with Trey Barco. And we did a bit of a training camp at um, Curtin University oh, yeah. in, in the heat room. Uni, that's where I went to uni for uh, two semesters. <laughs> <laughs> then dropped there. Yeah. <laughs> and then we so and then we trained down at South Frio. Um, yep. And then from there, it, it was Tour de France time, and it's just on at the perfect time over there. Like it was eight thirty on the screen, so of a night time we would yeah. you know stay up watch that for a couple of hours. And I just thought, you know, if I ever get the chance, I wouldn't mind you know finding out what's a go and yeah. uh, how it all works. And it, I wish I could sort of put it into context because it's just amazing. Like this, the sh whole show, not only the sort of fans on the sort of, um, sort of the road all the time, but how these guys just pick up and go and go and go. It's like oh, 190 Ks a day. Um, and then some days they're just like all out. Um, then they'll jump on a bus, go back to the hotel, which is an hour away, jump back in the bus, um, have dinner, go to bed. And just and then the process happens again the next day. Did you get day. to chat to a few of them about like their routine and you know what they're eating and consuming well, and how just, they do it mentally? Yeah, well, no, and I was there for day one and day two, and and they're usually pretty easy days to the tour oh, that yeah. uh, they start. But it was like it started in Spain, so it's basically whoever bids off and spends the most money. That's it, that's where the tour starts. Um, so it's just outside. Um, it's called Bilbao, and then from there they sort of like took off, you know went nuts. It was like a really hard stage. Um, and the, and the guy in our team finished second. So the second day we were the second car in line and I got to sit in the team car the oh, second amazing. day. And the, the team leader at the stage, he's at the start, he said, mate, enjoy seeing them now because it's the last you're going to see of them. But for the day, and I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, mate, like we're the second car in line, but you're not going to see the boys at all. Oh, there you but go. They sort of filtered back when they need to go to the toilet and that, but that's about it. Oh man, that's 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 a crazy experience to be in the car while they're flying. They're flying, aren't they? Flying and um and to be honest, like the communication, and all that. It's like they got a, a very much like a footy club, like a team plan. They had three stages to do, sort of uh, start, middle, and end. And then it was like, and the boys just sort of hang in there and and don't change too much. They get told what's coming up, what whether the road surface is going to change or uh, road furniture, they call it, so the traffic lights or a roundabout, you know, which way to go around the roundabout to save sort of maybe like 15 metres. Um, yeah. So it was pretty awesome. The marginal gains in that one, yeah, it's be, it's, it, I honestly don't understand how one separates themselves from that pack 
Americans. They yeah. just all train so hard. It's um, it's crazy. And then obviously, we so just back to the cricket. Were you there when um Pat Cummins hit the winning runs? Is that the no, nah, so yeah, no, I um, which test was so you? I was uh, there for Lords, but I only went to day one. Oh, so, day one, yeah, right. That uh, was the test just, day, wasn't it? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. And they were just hanging in there. Um, it was actually yeah a good day to go. Like Lords is amazing. Um, you'd all had to dress up. Yeah, when we got our ticket, it's like you can take um alcohol into the ground, and you know I went with a mate, um, Holly, and. I'm like, mate, uh, what's this? And he goes, we'll, we'll go buy like 200, they were, um, you're allowed to take two 500 mil cans into the ground. Um, so he went off and grabbed those and met myself and Brit. She came along to the cricket. She wasn't going to last long, but uh, <laughs> she came along with us and uh, she was allowed to take a bottle of wine. And then um, he took the two cans and and with that, we rocked up and there's bloke walking in with eskies. Oh, wow. And, and we were like, what is this? Like, this is crazy. Like, you're not allowed to dress up, but you're allowed to do this. And Matt is so well behaved. Like, it was crazy. Um, don't know if you'd see it here in Australia, if nah. that was the case. So, um, so we had our two cans and they went pretty quickly yeah. and then it was on to the next, uh, on to the bar. I can imagine Hall. I'm surprised Hall didn't drink them on the way in. <laughs> um, and, and did you learn anything about being around the boys? I mean, you've probably been around them before. I know Lang is a big fan of yours and you've, um, again, speaking of Hawley, I've seen photos of you boys in the rooms, <laughs> Boxing Day, you've been invited in, but... Um, was it just more catching up when they gave you the kid or did you, did you speak to a few of them about any tactics heading into the test? Yeah, no, m- more um, so it was more I just wanted to have a look at the operations of both of um, the events that I went to. So um, I went to the main training session before the Lord's test, which is a couple of days out, just to see who does what and um, how it's set up, team meeting and all that. Um, all pretty relaxed. Like they got five days of cricket to get through. So um, there wasn't too much time eaten up on too many meetings or anything like yeah. that. Um, some different cats, like to be honest, like the batters to the bowlers, um, really interesting combo. Give uh, us a bit like what, what would you well, say? Like, like, the mean, bowlers way more serious and the batters more relaxed? No, nah, opposite, I reckon. Opposite. Um, or more, maybe the batters are sort of just into their, they know what they need to do. Like they're just cricket lovers. Um, and you sort of, it feels like the kid in them. Like, and the kid as me as a footballer, like waiting on a sort of Thursday night for my Saturday game, um, gears already out, yeah. um, just a bit nuts like yeah, that. Yeah. Whereas the bowlers are sort of processed. They, you know, when, know when they're coming on, they've got sort of four overs to do their job, you know, need to drop it on the spot and um, just maybe just toil away a little bit. Um, and then, so that that was really interesting. And then you got a couple of the larrikins in between that sort of are the connectors. Who were the larrikins? Oh, I reckon, you know, f- just from the quick look that I got, but it was Alex Head. Um, and you could see the blokes that stir, could stir each other. So David Warner would stir the group up. Yeah. Um, but in a good way. Yeah, you know, yeah, they, yeah. They're on the road for a long, long time. Oh, yeah. So I don't know how they do it, to be honest. Oh, it's an amazing – I can't keep up with their with their fixture, the, the cricketers. Yeah. Like individually, yeah. if you're like, you know, mates a couple and you go, well, I don't know where you're playing. You know, one minute they're in India, next minute they're on tour, yeah. back in Australia for a couple of weeks, and then something will pop up. It's – yeah, it's crazy what they do. Mate, so they're off again. I don't know what's coming up now, but like um, – they must have good partners oh, or yeah. like, because <laughs> it's seriously like they, they spend so much time away from home. They um, do. But that's, I mean, any professional sport that you're going to do internationally, I, you know, the tennis is on at the moment and the US and it's like they're probably away for nine, ten months a year too. So nothing's easy if you want to be good at it. Nah, as you know, as you know, speaking of sport, um, you love your sport. I've heard you're a big fan, and that that makes that makes me happy. Considering um, you, when you come on here, mate, you got to get a couple of gifts, right? So I, I want to like give that. you a 250 voucher to our friends at Sports Where I Am. Too good. Sports Where I Am are a ticketing company. They're Australian owned. All their tickets are vetted. Uh, their customer service team's Australian as well. So when you're in a city, doesn't matter where you are in the world, and you want to go see some sport. Um, this is where you want to head. So what I've got here is I've got a little card. If you flip it upside down, it's got a okay. city and it's got all the sporting events. Do um, I flip it now? Yeah, flip it now. And I want you to pick one sporting event if you were to go to that city once you've read it out and tell me why. Uh, okay. So we're, we're in New York City. Um, have you been? I actually have. Yeah, been a couple of times. I've been to um, been to the basketball there, been to baseball. Um but where would I like to go? Actually, I've been to the NFL there too. Yep. And uh, I don't know if you have, but 
The stadium's just no, too like too far out. Too far out. Met life. I've been there once. And a bit lifeless. Twice too. actually. Like, yeah. It's just like a cement building. We like, actually had a mayor getting there. I remember our first time there, we were, we were just we struggled to get there the first time. Yeah. We ended up getting a maxi taxi and paying <laughs> oh, way overs yeah, yeah, because yeah. we didn't know what train and we didn't want to miss the game. Yeah. Um yeah, it is way out. Oh, crazy. Once so, you're there, it's good. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and then we – so Tom Brady was playing there, so that was helpful to sort of explain the game to my wife uh, because it was sort of like – so they – the guys in front, they just protect him to throw the ball and sort of she brought a oh, Patriots top sitting in a – uh, In a New York oh, crowd. New York. That's, so that's, I was like, oh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would I like to go watch? Maybe – like I love basketball. So oh, even yeah, fan. so even the Nets now probably not as sexy as what they were twelve months ago. Oh, but yeah, there's been or, a lot of turnover. Yeah, eighteen months ago. But um, I still hope Ben Simmons goes well. Um, and you know, it sounds like he's turning it around now. So hopefully that he gets his uh, gets it all together. I think um, I just saw today he wants to. His goal is to represent Australia in the Olympics. So he's had a lot of back issues, which people don't talk about. They talk about the mental side, but his body has been a, a bit banged up so hopefully yeah. um, he starts the season off well and gets back to his best because his best is very good I think we forget yeah. quickly don't we no we do and uh, there's there's always something about me like I like giving blokes a second chance and this he might be up to his third or fourth <laughs> but, yeah, he might be. you know as an Australian <laughs> wanting him to do well but he's what is he he's maybe only 26 27 not old, yeah. maybe not even that yet so um, Hopefully it goes well. Yeah, no, I love it, mate. I'm, I'm with you. We want to see all the Aussies do well and, um, yeah, third or fourth chance. <laughs> It'd be nice. Nice if you can, yeah, get to the Olympics with our team too, especially the way it's going at the moment. Yeah, I know. We would add a lot of um, – they'd compliment it nicely. Um, well, there you go. Well, Sports where I am, again, for everyone out there, use the discount code ACES at checkout um, and you might even see sell at the, the Nets. Yes. That's Nets. the one. Not the Knicks, the Nets. Yeah, well, and to be honest, like, yeah – the Knicks are, you know, at Madison Square. It's pretty sexy. It <laughs> but, is sexy, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're getting better too, so, but, yeah. Yeah, Brunson. Head and across to Brooklyn and uh, it's have a look. Yeah. Oh, I'm actually going to be there later in the year. I can't wait. I think we'll be doing the same. Brooklyn's lovely as well. There's a few yeah. cool spots popping up, so. Lots of Australians. Yeah, plenty of Aussies. Don't <laughs> worry about that. Mate, let's get into a bit of footy now. I'm keen to, um, I'm, I'm keen to start. I want to structure it so I can give you a bit of an insight. There's a lot to get through and clearly – um, I could be here for five hours, but I have to break it down. So the way I want to just let everyone listening and watching and even you just so you can start to think, but the, I want to, I've kind of split your career into three, Ooh. which is very hard considering it's so big, but it's, I'm going to talk about early days and that, yep. that's growing up and that's your, your, probably your first five years at the club, very, yep. a lot of success. Then we talk about not the struggle, more, more you as a captain and how many finals you've played, but you know, we're going to talk about the, just, just falling short and, and, and the grind and what you went through and just yep. how you, you know, how your mind was. And then obviously the fairy tale at the end. So that's kind of like how I've got it before yep. we move into the next one. Let's start growing up. Um, you know, as I said, I like to do a lot of research on my guests. And the one thing that the, one of the main things was just, you're so competitive and yeah. I want to know where it all started. I know you got older brothers and they all played and, um, but where were you, where, where did it all start? Well, you know, you're such a competitive beast yep. and it didn't start when you were playing AFL. It was when you were younger. So wh where did you, where did all this come from? Yeah. So I was, um, grew up in Bendigo and, uh, three brothers. So twins at the top, four years above me. And then I have a younger brother that's 20 months behind me. And, uh, we sort of, Scott and I got an in look to what Troy and Adam did, um, being the twins, and sort of like it was just the perfect age to just try and compete. And, uh, you know, they were our ones that, you know, we had a tennis court in the backyard that we would go out the back and play every sort of sport, you know, um, you know, tennis, but football, basketball on that court ended up being like scooter soccer. Like we were just making <laughs> yeah. up like table tennis. And we, like we just become really competitive at everything we did probably unhealthy in a way, um, <laughs> in many ways, but that was sort of what we knew. And then um, the good level up, we had uh, dad as a basketball coach. He wouldn't coach us in anything else, but he would, um, we never played together really. Maybe Scott and I played in a couple of basketball sides, but he would always uh, have this rotation that was like really strict, didn't matter how good you were, but um, you'd sort of spend eight minutes on the court, then you get rotated off and, and like it sounds like a bit of a, 
a whole system, a bit crazy, but it was really good because it taught me to like, you had to play with everyone and uh, you had to even your time out. And um, yeah, I mean, I loved playing sport in Bendigo because kids just love it. Didn't yeah. matter what it was. And for me, it was basketball and footy. Yeah, I love that. I'm very similar. Basketball was so enjoyable. Team sport, isn't it? Like you, yeah. were, you were you were a gun in athletics as well, which we'll get to later on. Yeah. But individual sport, like different nerves when you're playing with a team and you can try to get that team success. As, even as a junior, you meet so many more friends and yeah. um, all the parents but get get along and it's kind of like your lifelong friends, isn't it? When you look yeah. back, that's it. And um, like those friendships sort of went into school school groups and stuff like that. But along the way. Um, the journey sort of, you just get to involve like so many people and the parents um, get to spend so much time together. I just wonder, like, you know, I'm not at that stage where I'm driving, you know, and you <laughs> sacrifice your oh, life mate. for your kid or yes. your invest. But how mum and dad did it, like, you know, four boys that were crazy on sport. And the other side of it was we were living in Bendigo. So anywhere you had to go to represent um, Bendigo, you had to travel, whether it be Melbourne or, you know, go to Ballarat. They were sort of our rivals. Um you know, it's a, it wasn't easy. Do you think back when you're writing the book about this, did you think, does that when you started to go, wow, obviously, um, you know, we all know you're an amazing human and you've probably thanked your parents numerous times, but did it actually come back to you and go, geez, I didn't realize how much time they took out just to be, you know, just to look after us? Yeah. Well, I think I knew along the way. Um, so I always tried to sort of look after them, um, you know, in a fortunate position where you're playing for a long time that, um, and th they were still following me around towards the end of the, my career again, uh, traveling into state. And, um, like I wouldn't, like we, we didn't grow up with a lot of money or, you know, much at all. Like mum and dad, dad did a, um, a lawn mowing job, uh, on the side to make sure that he could pay for, you know, the extra sports that we would do basically. Um, and we would go and help him. And we knew that like, we learned that lesson to, which was really va valuable, to be honest, um, you know, that things don't come that easy. Mm. Um, so, you know, we were fortunate that we sort of got taught really well early. That's brilliant. That's good to hear. Um, back to the competitiveness, let's talk about a time where you where you did get beat because I've heard, I've heard that Vifal hates losing. He gets very grumpy when he rarely loses, but when you do, it, it, did your brothers always beat you or did you ever get one up on them every now and then? Obviously, you're much younger, but yeah. – any anything that pops to mind as a young fella? Right, I, I thought you were going to go like the, the, there was a tennis match that Tom Hawkins and I played. I haven't heard this one. Oh, uh, and Hawk tells it better than what I do, but I'm going to have my spin on it because <laughs> yeah. he yeah, well, he's got I reckon he takes some shortcuts. <laughs> yeah. So it was uh, w we were young at the footy club, um, and the day, like it was a sort of midweek um, start of the season. Um, really hot, like it was 30 degrees and we just went out the back sort of Geelong West and there's a couple of hard courts, loose stones. So it's not the best for your groins and that to play on. But um, we went there and Hawk just rocks up like he does about 15 minutes late, uh, no drink bottle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 30, nearly, yeah, 35 degrees. And we we're just going to play one set and because we knew that we had main training the next day. Um I went down in the first set and I said, mate, we're not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, yeah, no, no, okay, you know, I'll give you another shot at it. And then we played another two sets and I just like grind just – and I would chase everything down. He, as you could sort of know, as you could see with the big fella, anything that he does, he has like a nice sort of one hand or backhand. Smooth. Uh, yeah, not such a big serve but, uh, you know, a neat serve and stuff like that. So um, – but it got to the stage throughout like the second set and third set like that I had the drink bottle and he didn't. And I was like, mate, you're not getting any of my water. Like <laughs> you've got to start preparing well. So even that, like I just, you know, trying to teach him to prepare well, even, you know, for a simple game of tennis, like because he was so raw like in <laughs> so many so ways, good. but we loved, you know, the grind of it. But i actually not sure if I got him that day. But, he uh, got, did he get you, did he? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> the, the story keeps changing, so I think it's up to my turn that I got him. Yeah, let's just say so, you got him in the third. Yeah, exactly. So you, who won the second set? No, nah, I'll, I'll say that I got him in the second, but, so yeah. that's why we had to play the third to see who won. But, yeah, we'll say it's up to my turn. That's a piss. So I have heard some funny stories about the Hawk and obviously Jezza. They don't mind getting to the bakery and uh, <laughs> just they got a running tab there, don't they? Just well, they come. do, yeah. At the back, um, they live in freshwater 
to Creek, uh, Jezza does. So we can give away his address if the fans yeah. want to go there too. So, <laughs> but um, the, it, it is a, it is an all class sort of bakery that's out there, um, pies. But the sponge cake is like top notch. There you so, go. Yeah, he's wrapped his lips around a few of those. I <laughs> a little bit of sponge cake before the tennis, no <laughs> doubt, for the big hawk. Oh, that's a great story, mate. That's no water for the big fella. He would have nah. been dying 35 degrees. And he's given you the second set and you yeah. said bugger you. <laughs> and you know what? Hawk, when he was at the footy club to early days, like he was a hundred and, you know, anywhere from sort of 105 to 110 kilos. But it wasn't the muscle that it is now. Like he's built big that boy. along the journey. So yeah, <laughs> it was a big lump. You would have been moving him around the court, surely. I tried to. Uh, my style was more Leighton Hewitt and just hang in just there grind. and just grind him away. Um, <laughs> whereas he tried to finish a short, uh, the points a bit shorter. Yeah. No, nah, that's great. <laughs> that's brilliant, mate. That's brilliant. I um I also had, you know, th- 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 just examples of how competitive you are, um, you know, as we said. Apparently you had a mate, Brocky Bouch. I, I hope I'm pronouncing his <laughs> yeah, last name, yeah. but he used to live in Castle, Maine, and you used to make him drive 40 minutes just to play at Sandhurst so you could <laughs> just get him in your team, and then when a few others would get into town, you'd recruit them as well, actively recruiting at 14 years old <laughs> just to ensure you had the best team. They reckon your team was that stacked back then. It was the best team in the country. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. Like I was a little list manager at the time. So I went to a school, uh, Catholic College, Bendigo it was at the time. And we were like the, like if we were to go to States, you know, we would win pretty easy. Like we just had a really good side coming through. A lot of guys that sort of were competitive at that under 12 Vic sort of like age that, you know, could play good footy. And uh it got to the stage, I don't know, I just had brothers that played for this other side called Kennington Santos, which was like the state school side. So I thought that, you know, I'll go over there and compete against the school boys. Um, but um, as it worked out, there was a couple of boys that lived out of town and Brocky was one. Um, Johnny Coglin was another one. So Brock come from Castle Maine, 25 minutes from um, Bendigo. Johnny Coglin was, uh, he was Bridgewater. So he come in and then we had this... Uh, we go back to Hawley and he was Muldura and he came down to to play and he sort of knew no one, but he knew of me because of uh, his older brother played with my twin brothers at the Bendigo Pioneers. So actively recruiting at uh, 13, 14. That's so maybe brilliant. there's a future for me. I was thinking that. I think it's Andrew Mackey. Is he the, head, is he the list manager? He, is, he, he might is, have to watch so out. Watch out. <laughs> yeah, true. So, um, but yeah, it was good fun. And then we, so we knocked him off. Um, it was called under 13 and a halves at that stage. So, but under 15s. Oh no, they got us at under 13 and a halves. We got them at under 15s. Um, and yeah, got our got our act together. There you go. Speaking of under 15s, who who was uh, a better coach? Was it Gary Bryan or Chris Scott <laughs> on reflection? Who was the better coach? <laughs> well, Gaz will be tuning in, so he liked the uh, cheerio, but he stayed out of the way. He basically let us do what we wanted. Whereas Scotty was probably. He had a bit more pull. So. <laughs> there you go. Um, the, you would have been leading the troops at 15, telling them where to stand and what to basically. do. Basically, um, Oh, that's great. And then growing up, this is where I want to talk about footy. Uh, you know, this is where it could probably get serious. As we know, with, you know, young kids going through the programs now, you you make decisions around 15, 16, what, you know, you got to drop a few more sports out. Yep. Did you drop a few sports off then? Like, you know, when you're saying when you're kids, you, you, you do play a lot of sport, but... When did you take footy more seriously and start to stop playing the other sports? Yeah, so I played basketball till only about 13, um, which I wish I went a couple more years, but um, it was sort of just didn't fit. You know, I sort of, sort of started doing a little bit of weights, not not much, but like at the age of 14. Um, went, and then I did athletics on the side too. So athletics was the one that, you know, we're talking about being competitive at you know, before. And it was like, that was the one that I could just like go mad at. And every time that I ran, I just had to beat the time that I did before. So I didn't take much of a break, but um, I was sort of an 800 meter runner. Then I was a hurdler of all things. Oh, hurdler. Well done. I don't know how you, I don't know how the folks do that. And uh, it was a bit of an art, but um, I loved the hurdles. and And then the 800 meters was the one that, you know, I didn't have the speed to go with the guys, but I could like, Grind, grind, like, and I could go out faster than them just to upset them, and um, and I love that race um, because it was, you know, it ended up being just over two minutes, but um, it's enough just to really hurt too. Yeah, and I just took myself there like too often, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, locker. yeah, and I just loved it. Oh um, no, that was and my now I as think well, about yeah. it, and I'm like, geez, what's going on? Like, how did I do it? But. Um, 
You yeah. Gotta, um, yeah, you're right. And I was the same. 400 and 800 were my events. Yeah. And uh, the 400 was a bit more, if I didn't probably have the speed, but yeah, the 800, you could get them with a bit of, with a bit, a bit upstairs. <laughs> yes, mate. Yeah, exactly. Did you go out harder or would you try to pace yourself? So I, I was more of a bunny, go as hard as I can and hold yeah, on. A little bit of that. Um, and then, uh, so I used to compete against Nathan Jones, who had the long career at Melbourne, obviously. Um, and we did sort of from under 11s right through to sort of under 15s, little athletics against each other, state athletics. And um if we were just going one for one, that's very and, and Jonesy was a better like eight hundred meter runner than me, but occasionally I'd just knock him oh, off. Oh, you'd break him, yeah, occasionally, <laughs> but not often, not often. He that's was awesome. he was much better. So you'd go to these meets knowing Jonesy's rocking up, and you just wanted to just beat him every. Yeah, he was yeah. like you two were one and so, two, and he was yeah. Well, no, I knew him because he had the shaved head at the time, and there wasn't just there wasn't too many guys getting around with the shaved head. So there you go. He went from an eight early age, just went the nude nut and... Uh, oh, was he a nude nut early? He was, yep. Yeah. Uh, he was a Mount Eliza runner um, and because you would do it like so often. Um, yeah, you ended up sort of creating a little bit of a friendship. How nervous did you get before ru- running? I used oh, to, I'd never, I'd, Yeah, I never used to... I've, I've, I mean, yeah. I used to get so nervous before running versus any other sport. I don't yeah. know what it was. As I said, that's that individual sport where you I feel like you had the weight of the world on your yes, shoulders. Everyone's yes. watching and expecting you to do well. I still got those same nerves with... Um, sort of time trials and that too, which yeah. um, I was sort of always in the top sort of five, six at the footy club. But yeah, you would get to the start line and it wasn't until the like sort of last three or four years that I dropped that and I sort of felt okay. But um, it was good to get on edge, I reckon. Mm. Um, you know, I could run out in front of 80,000 at the MCG and never felt a nerve, but start the time trial in uh, <laughs> November and I've got these nerves running through oh, the yeah, guts. Yeah, um, you can't sleep. The guts are gone. <laughs> yeah, it's a different experience, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, and then this, is, this is like pages of your book that I, I've read um, yep. just as we were going on here. But 17 years old, you, you talk about how competitive you were. You know, you 120 kilos in, on the bench press <laughs> at 17, 50 kilo chin-ups, like weighted chin-ups, like – I don't think anyone was doing that at the Giants me last couple of years, like the 50 kilo chin. I was like, you must have been a beast in the gym. Yeah, I was. So I went, um, as I said, I'll probably start at 14 in the gym. Um, yeah, right. But it wasn't like, it wasn't crazy weights. So I'd be in there for like 30 minutes and um, tick things off. But uh, I had a knee problem uh, from the age of 16, 17. And uh you know, I just got into the bug of training. And uh, for me, it was, I could only go to the gym and then I could swim. So um, I never become a really good swimmer, but I, yeah, I got quite good at the gym. And uh, I had two exercises that I always had to do. And they were the chin-ups to warm <laughs> myself up. And then uh, and then I had to jump on the bench press. And uh, yeah, after a while, I just kept getting heavier and heavier. And so yeah, at the age of 17, I got it 120 out. That's um, but I think I only got to 125 in my career, yeah, like over a, the period of oh, time. Really? Like I went backwards um, as I was sort of, you know, trying to sculpt the rest of my body. I got to the footy club and I remember jumping on and doing a squat. And my first squat was in front of James Kelly. And he still reminds me and giggles till the day because I'm a toe walker and uh, I sort of couldn't get back on my heels and I sort of <laughs> gone forward and... Uh, yeah, I sort of. The, it was only sixty kilos, but you know, I nearly fell over <laughs> my first squat, and he, he just reminds me that whole time that's uh, too top heavy, <laughs> too top heavy. <laughs> that's great. What about when you walked in and were bench pressing with the Geelong boys? They go, oh, fuck, have a look, have a look, have a look at this yeah, bloke. Yeah, well, I went straight into the sort of group that's you know, as I said, I only got to one twenty five in the end, so I got, went into the heavy group in the afternoon, um, which was nice because then you would sort of cut a bit of time out of your day, um, but. Yeah, it was. Uh, it, it just showed them probably that uh, I was coming to play too, yeah. which was a, the nice thing. Like I wasn't coming to sort of wait around. And for them, it sort of was a little bit of a, okay, well, if, if it's good enough for him, then maybe we should all get yeah. on board and start uh you know, training a bit harder. Oh, mate, you make me look silly. We were doing broomsticks when I got, mate, we were making us, oh, yeah. they were making us do broomstick exercises for technique. And I'll never forget but when yeah. um, I got picked up, we we come back to, uh, you know, Christmas break because the drafts just, you know, you only get a month of training yeah. and you're getting looked after, you know. And and I'd lost weight. Like, I, I didn't yeah. lose weight, but I hadn't put on much size. And all my mates that got drafted had all put on five kilos. Yeah, and I yeah. go, mate, we're still using broomsticks and, and the barbells just to work on this technique. And half of the technique we'd already learned. You just, yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, but that's very all, different that was all Still a little bit now, like, they just protect those young guys um, because it's like 
be ready in three or four years because we're sort of set for this next little period. Yeah. Um, whereas I just didn't want to waste any time. Oh, it's good advice to the young ones out there. I mean, you've, you, you've, yeah, there's no point wasting time. And if you can replicate what you've done, it's, uh, <laughs> it's the way to go, I reckon. <laughs> um, talking about the early days, let's just, I want to, cause obviously we want to keep moving here to get through everything, but, yep. um, Early days is amazing. You know, I want to talk about the resilience with your injury. Your knee injury was significant. And you were told from specialists that you weren't going to be able to do things that you went on to do. I want to know how you dealt with that. Yeah. Um, and then also, yeah, that bit of mindset of like, no, nah, I'm coming to play and, yep. and how you become one of the most amazing young leaders we've ever seen. So I was, um, we, I go back to the surgery stage. And so I had four bouts of surgery in the space of sort of 18 months, um, Probably got the first one wrong where I tried to, they tried to sort of screw the bone. It was a piece of bone coming down from the femur, tried to screw it back on. Um, it just split off. It just a bit of growing pain more than anything else. Um, so then it sort of cracked. So we had to go and clean it all out. Um, that was the second one. And then we came down to a guy, Hayden Morris in Melbourne. And he had seen um, a similar surgery done. And then done it on Andrew Walker that used to play for Carlton. Yep, the big hanger. Yeah, yep. And so it was nice to sort of see that. And then I knew a little bit of Andrew from being a Chuka, Bendigo not too far away and coming through the Pioneers. So a bit of confidence in that, that it would be okay. Um, but it, it, there were still times where you'd, I just wasn't sure if it was. Like I was on crutches each time that I had the surgery, sort of eight weeks. And um, now you'd probably get put in a brace and it'd get looked after a little bit. But, um, you know, I was just really diligent and getting it right. But I remember the last one that I had, I sort of popped the cartilage um, in Bendigo and I was on like a Tuesday night at training, but there was a big sort of Vic Country um, sort of kind of like where we played, all played in Bendigo, the sides of Bendigo versus Ballarat, um, then Geelong versus Gippsland. And it was on a Friday night and I was like, geez, I want to play in that game. I know I've done my cartilage here. And I went out in that game and I only stayed on for a half because I gave away sort of like six free kicks and the coach <laughs> dragged me. And he said, mate, you, I can't put you back out there anymore. Like I had James Frawley running around with me oh, that shit. day. <laughs> and uh, and he just towered me up and, I, you know, the anger was coming out that I'd done the knee. Um, and it was only a small cleanup it's that crazy I needed. you were playing with that. Yeah. But I, and then so I had the so – went in, had the surgery and then, you know, the sort of – tears come for the first time. I just thought I'd always get over it, but the tears come and I was like, geez, am I ever going to get through like this? And it was the easiest surgery out of all of them. It was probably only a sort of four week and I could get back, but we decided to take the year off and uh, reset for what was to come. And yeah, I didn't lose my hunger through there, but I was just like, I, yeah, I doubted myself for the first time, first and only time really. How old were you there? You're 17? So I was, I was probably 18. 18. That was, yeah. a, that was your draft year. Yeah. Was that tough? Uh, a little bit because I only played sort of seven games in those last two years. And you were easily touted number one pick the year prior due to all the work you'd done. I as was an probably under higher than what I was the year that I went, um, only because I played an under-17 year where we went to Ireland with a group of guys, um, Mark Murphy, Xavier Ellis, Clint Bartram, and they all went and played footy the year that I was back in Bendigo playing. Um, missed the draft by a month uh, in those days, and, but it was good. You know, to be honest, it was really good to stay in Bendigo, finish school, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, get my chance at it. But, um, yeah, I wouldn't say that I would have gone any higher in the draft. Like, at that time, like, Nick Rewatt was a sexy player in the league. So, um, you know, we I had a lot of guys in my draft go for, in between sort of like number two and number six that were sort of like 195 and could run a beep test of 15. Oh, really? Yeah. I just looked at the draft last night. So Bryce Gibbs one to Carlton, Scotty Gumbledon, big gumbles to Essendon yep. at two, Lachlan Hansen three, Kangas, Lewenberger to Brisbane Lions, Travis Boak at Port, uh, Mitch Thorpe six at Hawthorne, and then you seven at Geelong. Did you ever think that you might have went to another club? I love hearing these drafts because yeah. this is a pivot. Like, you know, you got to yeah, remember, yeah. like, the, pick seven, Geelong. Like, you know, you look back now and go, wow, like, that is an amazing pick. Um, you know, Hawthorne, Port, Brisbane, Kangas, Essendon, Carlton, they're probably kicking themselves. <laughs> yeah, well. Did you have any conversations? Um, like I was a little bit of the list manager in, in me again, but it was like <laughs> Brisbane maybe um, because sort of Blackie and all those were coming to an end. Luke Power, you know, maybe got a couple years with them and then that would be the 
and for them. But then I thought, once I got through there, I thought, oh, Port Adelaide. And I, I remember speaking to, like, getting interviewed by him and um, Choco was pretty wild back then in the interviews that he I did. I heard some funny stories with and Choco. And I, I basically got on the front foot and, you know, he goes, oh, what would you think about coming to Port Adelaide? And I, and I sort of said to him, I said, I just don't think it's really that good of an idea for not only myself but my family. Like, we're in two states already, Adam's in Perth and then Troy's up at Brisbane. Um, and I just said, I just don't think it really works. That's great. <laughs> for mum and dad. Um, <laughs> he would have been shattered. Oh, yeah, yeah. But they still back themselves in. So, yeah. th- you know, they took Bokey, who was, you know, we were level pecking at the time, but he was playing great footy at the Falcons. Um, and then, yeah, I just didn't think I'd go to Hawthorne for some reason because of um, they just got Jordan Lewis and they had Luke Hodge. Um, so that they'd had their midfield group, Sam Mitchell, already there, set to go. So... Uh, in saying that, there wasn't really a midfield spot for me at the Cats. You know, I sort of had to make one out on the wing for a period of time. Yeah. Well, that's it. And that's exactly what you did. Um, you, you talk about coming into the the league and making an impact, you know. Like, I, as I said, I'll reflect and go, geez, I was raw. You, you, yeah. the, you, you just touched it before. You're like, I'm coming here to play. Um, how did you, as I said, how did you become such a successful young leader so quickly? Like, how did you get the respect of your teammates? Yeah. It'd be great to share with everyone out there. Yeah. So it, there was a saying sort of as we walked in the door um, that, you know, you wanted, that we, you needed to be respected before you were liked. And I understood that probably more than the other young guys. So being respected was go out there and just train and train hard and get better every session. Um and the, the liked part would come on the back of that. So, you know, be polite and, you know, make sure that you catch up with your coaches um, and build relationships around that. But the the, fi- the bit that I found easy was like, get better. Mm. Um, and if they could see me doing that, and it wasn't so much for them, it's like, as I said before, I just wanted to play AFL, you know. Not that I didn't, um, I wouldn't do my time in the VFL and I had to go back there a couple of times that first year, but it was like, I just wanted to play AFL you know, the biggest stages uh, against the best sides and uh, tackle it that way. What did it look like? Like, I'm talking training. Like, you see yep. training now, um, were you tackling the guns? Were you – what were you doing differently? Don't name the other guys, but, like, just so yeah. people can visualise, you know, these – there might be someone getting drafted listening to this, so they go to a club. What does it look like? What's the application of work look like? Well, you literally eye off the best and you have a crack at them. That's um, but apart from Ling and Max Rook. Uh, so they, they they would compete against each other and they would show us what the standard was. Oh, they'd um, go, two bulls going yeah, at each other. Yeah, and, and we literally were bulls at that stage. Um, we, we got into a period at the footy club where, you know, we didn't think that we were big enough. Um, so we literally had weight sessions where we were doing weight lifters programs. And, um, and for that period of time, the boys just, you know, got really big and strong and competitive footy was our advantage. So um, Ling and... Max Rook would go, and then you would take on Bartel, Ablett, um, James Kelly, and you'd you know you'd just filter through them. Joel Corey was the next one, just toe to toe with all of them. Yeah, yeah, and uh, they were all different. And uh, there was blokes that you didn't like going against, and and all of them at different stages because the one thing that they would, you know, if we go back to being competitive before you liked, they hated losing. Like all of them hated losing. Chapman and Johnson were another two. Like, and because if you got the wood on them. And you're a young bloke. Uh, they want to like they would throw their arms in like no tomorrow <laughs> yeah, too. Imagine, so, yeah, uh, which is a competitive but really nice too. And I know I can only imagine as well being in a locker room. All the old boys would be going, "What about Jolly giving it to you out there today as <laughs> an eighteen year old?" Yeah, it's funny, but like even when we come in indoors, like a game of basketball, like there was nothing off the table that. You know, if Stevie was on the basketball court or table tennis, it had there had to be twenty bucks on the line. Yeah. So, like, as a young bloke, you just wouldn't play him because he didn't know money or anything like that. Yeah. But poor Shannon Burns, uh, the amount of times that you know Stevie would just talk him into Milking. going again. You yeah, know, Burns he would be like forty bucks up, and then by the end of the day they're back even because Stevie would play him until the grind was uh, there. Stevie so. makes me laugh, mate. Oh, oh, very good. That is that is so good. And then. Let's talk about the flags, 07, 09, 11. Yeah. It's pretty cheeky of me just to say, let's talk about all three at once because they're all, you could talk about each of them and those seasons for hours. But the success early on in your career, like, you know, looking back, like, you know, talk to me about it. Like, what yeah. was it like being so young and having so much success, team success? Yeah. Oh, 
like I just didn't know any other way, to be honest. Like um, I went two and three for my first five games uh, and then I had one more loss in like the next sort of 50 games. So like, and, and that was uh, a grand final against wow. the Hawks because the game that I missed at the end of 2007, I didn't play. Um, like the side was unbelievable that I was playing in. I knew that it was really good. Like we would rock up to games and it would have had them won within the first 20 minutes. Um, and But the, the good thing about it is like we – you sort of knew what each other was good at and but you knew also like where you stood. So you didn't go to get overpaid or anything like that because you, you knew that we needed to share what was there. I've heard um, about that actually. I heard about – um, and this is the culture down there and you've been a big part of it and there's probably been plenty of blokes that before you, but the, the culture of also, yeah, not not taking too much off the table so that you can share and, and win more flags. Um, that's a real thing, as you just said. Like, was there any, ever any incidents where, you know, maybe players don't name them, but they were maybe trying to get more and then, you know, the leaders would go, hey, leave some on the table? Or is it just really. kind of a, was it just kind of a given that? Yeah, you, it, it was a bit of a given and it probably wasn't spoken about like, back then, but as my career went on, like we would invite boys to, you know, not, we wouldn't have that sort of list management decision, but we would, you sort of give them an understanding of this is how list management works. Like, do you want to bring Gary Ablett back and play with him from the Gold Coast? Because if you do, um, well, he's not going to cost us much, but the flow on effect is this, this, and this. So it might be, you know, the young player that's coming through, we might have to let go of, um, or, um, you know, he's going to play a little bit of midfield minutes. Um, so Cam Guthrie, um, Joel Selwood, you're going to, you're going to have to go play on a wing, um, because you got Tim Kelly coming in too. So the, all those learnings, like we, we tried to give him the experience of like being a leader of a footy club as, as much as we could yeah. when we were building stands, like it's like, who's interested in building? Cause you know, this is what goes on and, you know, allow them to be a part of those meetings too. That's, that's, it's awesome. It's so good. And it obviously stands up. Give me, um, let's go 07. Give me one, yeah, one thing that comes front of mind that, in that game. Uh, well, Just if well, I had bang. Uh, the lap of honour, to be honest, at the end. Um, and it's just amazing, to be honest, like Corey Enright <laughs> and the celebration for that 44 years, uh, drought broken, uh, lots of happy tears. And anything you remember from the, the streets? Uh, so uh, the Geelong streets went mad, like, uh, climbing sort of the, um, traffic lights and all that. Like we saw the vision of all of it. Um, but there was one, there was a black cat and ho hopefully you can find it, but, uh, yeah, Braden, he, Braden to find it. <laughs> but Corey Enright and Max Rook had been given it, um, out on the ground in the lap of honor. And, uh, this black cat followed him around. Like it wasn't real. It was just like, <laughs> I was basically a gnome, but it followed him <laughs> around for like the whole week. That's and, so and literally it was like, it would have like darts out its mouth <laughs> and stuff like that. So when it got to Mad Monday. And yeah. so that was uh, a reminder of, you know, how fun the boys could be too. That, that's awesome. That is awesome. That, that first one would have been incredible. And as you said, you didn't know anything else, but yeah. considering the drought, that's, uh, there's obviously a few more to talk about, but that drought, did you see, after, you know, now that you've won four, but the emotion on so many people's faces are a little bit different for that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And you still get thanks for it, like, Till to the day, and yeah. but it turned the lights back on in Geelong. Like Geelong was a pretty tough place to get players to. Like we got Otto down, um, which would be great for the show. You should get Otto in at some stage. Definitely <laughs> a great person. But he, um, apart from him, we really couldn't, couldn't trade recruit. and get people in. Um, Cam Mooney, we got off the back of um, you know opportunity, but um, we got Otto down, and then the win helped us. Uh, more than anything else. Turn the lights back on in Geelong. Then we got the light towers after that. Um, so, and then like, to be honest, like through COVID, um, the area is just like gone bananas again. So 
Um, we're not all as lucky as Jez that have got farms sort of 15 <laughs> minutes out of Geelong, but um, it is a great place to live. He loves it, Jez. He says it's, a, I mean, the Giants is one of the most spectacular clubs. Jez that talks so highly of the of Geelong. I can only imagine what's going on down there. It's, it sounds special. Yeah. Um, so there you go. 2007, big moment for the club. And obviously you're talking about getting players down there. Um, and then let's talk about 09. Let's stick to success. Yeah. Uh, memories from that one? Well, it was a must win. Like even, um, so 2007, 2008 were more process driven. If we do enough right, then we'll win um, and do that. But uh, 2009 was must win after losing 2008. So we got to that stage and, um, you know, it was a pretty easy reminder for the boys. Um, we may not have been the best side in it that year. Um because St Kilda, the side that they had, stacked up just as well. It maybe, maybe if not better. Um, but we got them. Uh, they, we got them because you know on the day at, at the right moment, maybe we just did enough right. Yeah. But it was only just. What memory does it? What memory do you think about with that game? I love asking you. Um, well, there... Harry Taylor's mark late um, was huge because they were still coming. Like we're talking the last minute of the game and it was it was the most brutal game like there wasn't uh people that had got 30 touches or anything like that it was more just like crashing bodies hit um and the celebrations like they were poor like because we were so exhausted yeah yeah um, and we just knew that we had to win so it was just like a relief more than anything else there you go it's funny compared to the 07 so yeah. mad, mad monday uh the, actually i'll save mad monday later yeah. i've got some questions about your out you you guys do it the best in the league i just saw the boys the other day um and then 11 yeah uh so we had the maybe best player in the league at the time leave at the start of the season in gaz um, is that tough it was, yeah, it was. Um, but at the same time, we got on with it um, pretty quick. A great time to bring in Chris Scott too. Um, and Scotty was 34 when he started coaching the Cats. Um, to think of that now, like I'm 35 sitting here and um, he just summed up the situation and the team really well. Um, you do a 90% really well, boys, from what I can see, but 10%, let's just change. And that was more around maybe defense than anything else. Um, but allowed us to be us. Um, and he just, you know, worked with us really well. And we didn't get our act together. You know, we, we just spoke, talked about the build, but, you know, our best footy was at the right time of the year. Peaked at the right time. Yeah, just peaked at the right time. Like we were a good footy site, and then we got better and better, and then we were the best mm. just on the day. Yeah, it's good. It it's, reminds me of 2022. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, yep. just peaked and just yep. popped late into the year. Um those early memories, as you said, at what? So we're going to go to the stage two now. So you, you're um, you've had so much success early on in your career, as you said, you didn't know anything different. Yeah. When did the the next ten years? We're going to talk about that ten years in this patch of the as the point two as I've got here yep. in my head. But at what point did you go? Wow, this is this is becoming tough. Like yeah, yeah. just because you, you you would have had expectations of winning ten the way you were going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, like, at the end of each year, like, what sort of separates Geelong from others, I reckon, like, we always took a deep breath. Um, and the, and what we did was, like, well, are we going to do it again? You know, are we going to have another shot at it? And that was an easy question to answer. Like, with the guys that we had around me, I was fortunate, you know, I had a Hawk in the forward line and Harry Taylor in the back line. So that was sort of the core. But then we had, you know, players that just, got the best out of themselves, you know, along the journey. So our role was just to set up the program and we were never going to be get the early picks or anything like that because of where we finished on the ladder. But how can we coach our side to be the best um, and just worry about that? Whereas when we come up some, against some good sides through that period, like we couldn't be Hawthorne because we didn't have what they had. But how are we going to beat them? Like we always like strive to do that. Um, we couldn't get them. Richmond was a little bit similar. Like we went for the kick mark style because they were so KO, KO um, in what they did. So um, we, we would always, you know, work to our strengths. Um, but the the balance of it is sometimes you don't get there, but you got to be brave enough. Mm. Um, and, and that's what we were always like. And I got to the end of my career and I was just forever grateful that they gave us the opportunity, like the list management team. Like we would go out there and try and get the best players down. Um uh, you know, 
at the end of the day, you know, if you want to do great things and sometimes it's not going to work out, but if you hang in there enough, um, maybe you just might be lucky enough. It's well said. And and and, and, I'm, and and I want to position this again with what I'm saying. Making a prelim isn't a failure. Like we know how important, we know how hard it is to make finals. Yeah. Here we are talking about, was it three prelims in four years, you come up short and then also yeah. a granny. It's not like you weren't, see, like it's, if you know football, that's success, you know, it's just, you just didn't finish. Success is obviously the, the premiership, but yeah. to get to finals every year, it, it just kind of sums up blokes like yourself and the program and the people in the program from everywhere, you know, as yeah. I said, it's not just the players and coaches, it's the yeah. whole footy department, the club. Um, it, it's, it's such a successful place, isn't yeah. it? And so it's crazy. So we, I played in 12 prelims in 16 years. That's so crazy. it's like... That's unbelievable. But, but some of it is like, because of the big losses that we had um, throughout those finals, like not only the prelim final, but some of those first finals that we had, when it gets to that, those games late in the year and we, you know, we may see them again this year again, um, but you've got to try and win the games and mm. you throw some things out the door, like when you're sort of three goals down um, to have a shot at that um, kick through the corridor that usually you you might go down the line and, you know, it might be a two-goal game and then it probably looks a bit better. Um, we got in a stage where we just couldn't finish off um, the end of year right. Um, but we learned lessons along the way. Um, and we can say that now because we won it last year. But um, I, I still felt like throughout those journeys of those finals that we come up against, as tough as some of the losses were, like we were getting better um, and – players, you know, we'd find out a bit more about them, whether they could do it or not. And um, that's what last year meant to me, that I was so grateful that a lot of those guys that have been through those prelims with that they finally got a medal at the end of it. Yeah. Uh, not only for last year, but for the years before that too. Yeah, well said. What were some of the lessons you learned in losing prelims and finals and whatnot? You know, what would you – talk about that deep breath. You yeah, know, what so would you, we go um, – probably I looked at myself first um, – and there's probably only once where I thought, fuck, like maybe you should hand it out, like the captaincy over. Um, so I brought it up to the coach at one stage, a, a corridor chat that we did regularly, um, and he just didn't agree with it. So we moved on from there, <laughs> and, and that's as simple was as that it, what it was. Was that a bit of self-doubt creeping in? Well, it was, and it was just initially after the game. It was Richmond, maybe 2020, was it? Nah, it was before then, maybe the... 2017 or 18. Yeah. We drove out of the MCG and we just like got it all wrong on the night. And, um, you know, I just felt like maybe for this group to just find out what's next, um, then maybe they need to look at something else, do it a different way. But uh, he didn't agree, you know, and that was a that was one of those deep breath moments. Just like, okay, hey, I'm not taking that at the moment. Go away and get ready for next year when you're ready. So, yeah. and, and to be honest, it'd only be sort of three weeks in and then it'd be like, okay, Time that's to get okay. ready again. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. And and part of that was like, okay, pick up some blokes um, before Christmas, before you got back into training and tell them where you're training and try and get as many as you can along. And sometimes there would only be five blokes. Sometimes you'd get 10. Um, but, you know, even that was like, okay, they're still on board. Yeah. Um, which was a good test. sign. Yeah, it's a great sign. Um, I've skipped over the captaincy stuff. I want to go back quickly. You know, you're a young skipper. You've got the record, man. You've got every record. You've, you, you, you are, I'm talking to royalty here. It's, um, it's amazing what you achieved. You know, as I said, I don't normally look into stats and all yeah. that, but I did for this one. And I, um, you know, I'm not a footy nuffy, but yep. geez, did I, I nearly needed a, a, a month to go on Wikipedia or where I was just to look at all the things you've accomplished. But one of the things, um, you know, uh, being such a young skipper, you know, I want to know how you handled that and also like just how you evolved as a skipper over the years. Yeah. So um, I was 23 at the time when I become captain and I was captain of like Scarlet and Enright and, and blokes like this. But like I said before, it was on performance that I'd become captain. So they just said, just keep doing what you're doing. And around that, I had good management and a footy manager, CEO, um, Steve Hocking was sitting in operations of football then and Chris Scott that protected me like I didn't even know at the time. But we, we had good media performance too. Like Moons could look after things and James Kelly could look after things, Jimmy Bartel. So I didn't feel like I had to go and do speak in front of 200 people. Like 
that came along the journey that I got better and better at those things. Um, but performance was the key, you know, when I was a young leader um, and just, again, getting better with every session, with every game. And then it got to, I went through a stage of the free agency period where it probably had to change. Like I was getting blokes into the footy club that, um, you know, you had to build the relationships quickly for you to be good again. So we brought in sort of like Reece Stanley and Zach Tui. Um, we brought in a lot of guys, to be honest, Paddy. And you had to make them Geelong um, and feel like that this place was theirs, even though that they'd spent, you know, seven, eight, nine years elsewhere um, and make them feel part of the furniture that we're not the Geelong of when I started. We're the Geelong of now. And um, and I actually enjoyed doing that. I had I had so much help, though, along the way. I speak of those guys before, but then the playing side of it was Hawk, who made me smile and be a kid and uh, joke around and enjoy the locker room the most. Um, and then Harry Taylor, who was the detail man that was um, a bit stricter and sterner, but kept us all on track too. Yeah. So surround yourself with great people, but yeah. it's, it, you've, you've broken that down beautifully. Um, leadership looks so different. We'll talk about it later, but yeah, being young and and focusing on just being a great player really, isn't it? Like yeah, when you it say, is. as a young um, player, just get your, just do your job first. Don't worry about all that other stuff. Yeah. And even now, like towards the end, like the back, like that, the last year of my career was uh, with all that was going on outside of football with Brit and uh, trying to have a baby, it was like, I've just got to get back to performance here. How and, did you do that? How did you block out all that? You know, you talked about the struggles yeah. with Brit and um, and also, as you said, like, I don't know, I doubt you had ever had a form slump, but just say the team or someone in the team struggling and no doubt you would have been there for them and all the conversations. And the, as I said, the common theme with doing research on you is you're, you're an amazing human. Yes, you're an amazing player, but you're an amazing human. So you're talking to all these people um, in the Geelong community and yeah. also then you've got to go out and then perform on the weekend. How did you, how did you do that? Ah, uh, so it, a bit of help in the end. Um, like I didn't do much of the mindfulness stuff uh, throughout my career or, um, you know, even sort of mind coaching. Um, but at the end, I had this lady help me. Her name was Anna Box. And it was only in my last year. And literally, um, there was a few things that were going to start happening. Like I was going to start missing games just to be fresher throughout the year um, for the back end of the year. And then I didn't know at the time, but um, about round 20, uh, sorry, around round 12, I was going to start starting on the bench. And, uh, and when I, not, not <laughs> when I got told that, but like when it got sprung on me, I was like, holy shit, the fuck. Like, yeah, the how can the captain, how can the captain start on the bench? I haven't done this since round, like my first season. Um, and I had to get my head around it quickly. And, and, and there was a bit of silence in it, but it was like, okay, be the best teammate be the best teammate and come on and do what I needed to do. And I, to be honest, I, I was fortunate that I had that Anna to lean on to go, well, some, help me sum this up and how I can be the best teammate from there. Um, and, it, and that was the really, you know, that was driving me more than anything else. Like come off the bench and, okay, I'm going to hit these guys with a bit of, you know, what I was probably better at, the grind than the power that sort of Paddy and all those had at the start of the game, I sort of summed it up a bit better. But by me getting out of the way at the start of quarters was so important for those other players that I trusted them. Um, but when I took games off, I just trusted them to do it and they just kept getting better. Like mm. um, we speak of Grime Myers and Brad Close and Sam DeConing and Max Holmes and like they become better players for me getting out of the way. Yeah. And, and yeah, well, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's great leadership and you just adapt quickly. You know, and yeah. speaking to someone like that is just, it's its sound advice for someone that's kind of, the ego would have got you at the start, would you say? No doubt. It uh, does with all of us. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and when you're playing tennis with the hawk. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it does with all of us. And uh, and I had to not drop it because it's still like at times I was like, geez, I'd love to start. <laughs> I'd love to start and have a crack at this, you know, Libra and Bonta in the middle. and yeah. uh, But it, I just knew that, you know, I needed to, change. Um, I needed change for the side. And and when we got rolling, you know, the confidence that the boys, you know, had, it was just like, jump on the wave with them, mm. um, get out of the way a little bit um, and lead a different way. Yeah. Lead a different way. That's It's powerful. Did you, before I get to this fairy tale point three, 2020 season, um, did, did retirement ever cross your mind earlier? And I don't mean to be disrespectful yep. asking that. I, no doubt we thought you could go again and again, but you know, as you, as you know, when um, 
you're walking past the coach and saying maybe I shouldn't be skipper and all that kind of stuff. Did, did anything like retirement come through your mind earlier? Yeah. No, it didn't. Like I was contracted pretty much my whole time. So, oh, um, which, um, yeah, I mean, I was f- fortunate, but I also sat in that position where I had brothers that weren't in that position too. So I, I understood a little bit of what that player that goes through that, you know, contract year to year side of it was. But I would treat myself like that too. Like I I didn't get to the end of um, 2021 and go, well, that's it. You know, we had a shocking loss to Melbourne over there. Um, there was more that went into, you know, those performances that we knew that others didn't know. So the noise becomes loud because we're getting older. Um, you know, looked we looked slow on that night. Like we couldn't take on Petrarca and Oliver um, the way that we were doing it. Yeah. So starting on the bench made a lot of sense. You, we're going to need a big side to take on Petrarca and Oliver. Um, and, and part of that, you know, was like you'd be a part of it but play your role too. So learning that side of it was um, – you know, really enjoyable, but it's maybe a better person too, I reckon. Yeah, well said. The whole thing of being too old, did it piss you off? No. Nah, or did you guys just have bit, a laugh about it? A little bit more of a laugh than anything else. Like, And the people that come out with it, um, you, you just keep them on the back of your mind too. <laughs> and the thing about it, like we would get to training throughout, you know, the November, December, and we would be so driven. Like that's why the age just thing didn't come into it for us. Like we would be young at heart. Mm. Um, and you know, with the time trials and that, like big Hawkey just hated missing training sessions. Like yeah. it wasn't good for him to do all of them, but like try pulling him off. Like he just wasn't coming off. Like, and he still does it to the day. Um, so the, the like the hunger and you know, the will to get better, like we just believe that you could get better every year and that's a wrong sort of mindset to have. But even late, like even, uh, the start of 2022, I was like, I can have my career best year this year. And it's going to look a little bit different to what it's looked like when I was 27, but my career best year is going to be this year. And and with that sort of outlook on it, it's sort of helped us, I reckon. Yeah, it's good. It's And it's, it's good for everyone to listen to, like, that mindset. Yeah. It's different. And, and even when we're bringing guys in. So Isaac Smith at the end of his career at Hawthorne, it was like, uh, I think he got offered probably more years at Melbourne at the time, um, but it was like – and we may give you a two-year contract, but you can be here as long as you want. And I think that's refreshing for guys at that age. As long as you can rock up and try and get the best out of yourself and we'll set up a framework that will suit, you know, our playing list. Um, you know, we, we may not have all the bells and whistles, but we'll set up the best game plan that we can. It's powerful stuff. Everyone talks about the framework of – you know, training and the program and how much free time there is if they need it. But then players go, oh, I've got free time. I want to get better. So I'll just drive to the club on my day off and just allowing players to drive their own careers. And they reckon that no one does it better than Geelong. If you do speak to people, you know, a lot of, I guess with that success, they probably learnt the the recipe. But um, is that something that also that you pitch when you're trying to recruit players? Uh, well, it's hard to pitch unless you're in there, to be honest. So it's, um, you can say it, but you know, they've heard it all before. Oh, a day off, you're still going to get me in for half a day. Um, the the thing about it is we hand over to the individual, go, how good do you want to be? Uh, because it's really up to the individual more than anything else. And we hand that over at the age of 18. Um, be the CEO of yourself. Like half the blokes don't even know what a CEO is uh, <laughs> at the age of 18. So it's quite weird. Um when you say that, and then you tell them, okay, we've got play development officers and we've got, you're going to get a massage twice a week and there's yoga if you want to do it, but, you know, it's up to you. Um, and if you want to do hands before you go out to training, we'd suggest it, but it's up to you if you want to do it. So um, the balance of it, we allow the guys to find it. And a little bit of that is too, because we want them to get to the end of their career and go be able to sort out their life a little bit too, rather than living by a schedule and going, I need to be here and I need mm. to do this nine to five or, you know, dot, dot, dot. Little things like that, you know, really proud that we can set up a place where a Tyson Stengel can come across from um, Adelaide and, and go, I just want to be treated like an adult. And you go, well, I can do that, Tyson. Um, as long as you stay in line with the, the framework that we set up, then go for it. And, yeah. And 
you know, he goes and does what he does and you're like, that's nothing of like what we do. And that's nothing of the Geelong Footy Club, but that's the kid being the CEO of himself. Yeah. That's a great story when you speak about um, oh, Tyson. So good. The, let's talk about 2022. Um, yeah. How do you sum it up? Oh, uh, I smile at it because it's like, it's literally the best year. Um, you know, the, the footy club, um, a few changes through it, but we got some coaches in, um, James Kelly, uh, Matty Egan, Harry Taylor, Shannon Burns. Um, so the, the coaches that went out had just done a huge amount of work in getting, you know, the place hardened and tough. Um, I speak of Matty Scarlett and Corey Enright, Matty Knights. Um, and then, and James Raleigh's another one, even if we date back a little bit further. So, but it was like the group was like we were ready to go, um, but we just knew that we needed to do it differently. Um, so, and with that, we sort of had the two best key forwards and a part of it was like, let's just get the ball down to them. And as simple as that sounds, it was like, let's just start with that in the preseason. And it was like a, a bit of all attacking more than anything else. And then we'll build on our defense after that. So we would start the ball on one side of the um, back 50 and it would be like, boys, take the ball across the other side of the ground and into the forward line as fast as you can. And I don't care how you do it. That's so, awesome. So, uh, yeah, and with that, you know, blokes like – we were doing a bit of a kick mark style before that. It just didn't help, like guys like Ryan Myers and, and Closey and uh, Tyus, like – in that sort of a style, like you're competing against sort of 16 blokes, if that's the case, by the time they flub back, if we could get in quicker, then it opens up not only Hawk and Jez, but um, Tice to kick 50 goals. Um, and it just, you know, the the love kept coming and, yeah. we, and we kept getting better and it got to a stage where we, we thought we were okay. Um, and then we had a loss against Frio and we sort of got a kick in the teeth down at um, GMHBA and then we come away from that we're like all right, we're like we're still losing the same way and we were soaking it up a bit like mm. um, so it was like we need to change this for the Max Holmes and Sam DeConings and like they, they've only seen one way of us losing and it's not good enough like it's just when we lose let's start you know losing together too so we never come in as a group after the game and sit in a meeting but we did after we lost to St Kilda at, um, at Marvel it is Marvel, isn't it? I'm yeah, up it is to Marvel. Marvel now. Yeah, I always say Eddie Ad. Yeah. That's Marvel, mate. <laughs> it was the the Telstra Dome Dome. on one stage for me. <laughs> um, but we, we come into the meeting room afterwards and we literally just said to them, boys, if we're going to win together, we're going to start losing together too. And there was like a little <laughs> bit of a giggle amongst the group, like, oh, that's weird as. And, you know, yeah. and, and with that, maybe only just a one percenter, but, you know, it made the younger guys feel a little bit like, oh, good, we don't have to, you know, stress. Because yeah. the one thing that we always did was if you come in Monday, you should be able to tell it, shouldn't be able to tell if we won or lost. So um, we're never going to get ahead of ourselves if we have a big win or if we lose, you know, a tough game. I love don't, that. Don't, don't stress on it too much because we're going to get back on the horse and get better yeah. this week. And then, as you said, you've done that, probably that younger players are feeling more relaxed. Your form, <clears throat> would you win, 16 in a row? We did 15? in the end, yeah, 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 and probably a couple of lucky ones in there. Yeah. Like, um, but like we got into a position where we fell behind at times, and then we come back and won. So we just got a bit of a taste of everything. So there was a belief that even if we got it wrong on a particular day, then um, you know we could could win it from any situation. I know for a fact you went and helped Mick Barlow and the Werribee boys last week. This just goes to show how, you know, friendly you are with your time. And you did talk about the first game against the Pies. I'd love you to share a little bit yeah. um, of what you shared with the group there and, the and I guess, the belief that you all had after that win. Yeah, so we probably got a, we got a fair bit wrong that night, like um, even just positioning on the grounds um, with what we wanted to do. Um, Paddy started on the bench for like all four quarters, I think, um, which we sort of, I'm not sure why, but we sort of never had done that before. Um, and we won a bit more on talent than anything else. And we hadn't really relied on that all year, apart from Jeremy sort of winning round three for us against Collingwood, where he kicked sort of five goals oh, in the I last quarter. That, yeah. But he'll enjoy that being brought up. <laughs> uh, and then this game was a little bit the same. Like we we the six six and six rule. We should have given away sort of four or five free kicks. Like our detail was off, um, and Collingwood were up and going. Like they probably played better footy on the night, 
but we hung in there enough um, to, to, to give it a shot at the end. And the big plays, the big moments um, come down to, you know, players just doing the right thing at the right time that we'd, that we'd gone over a number of different times throughout the year. So um, when we got away with that one more than anything else, um, you know, and walked off the ground, it was like, well, we, we sort of stuffed that up tonight, but we won. Uh, we were good enough to win. And then it was just like, whatever we get next, we're going to be fine with um, because we're not going to make the same mistakes. So our next game was Brisbane um, in the prelim and we were more than ready. Um, and the confidence just grew from there. It's um, it's funny how the hardest game was the first one. And then yeah. and then it gets it gets so sweet, doesn't it? You get to yeah. the, as you get to the grand final, um, did you know you, you, did you know you're going to retire? Yeah. And had you told anyone, like, I know you did, this is what I, uh, this is what I want to bring up as well, uh, again, is with you being such a, you know, thoughtful human is what I would say with everything else going on, you, you deliberately messaged loved ones and your best friends and, and, and personalized all messages to let them know first before anyone else that you were going to hang them up. Um, when did you know and who did you tell? Yeah. Um, uh, so I had a, we had a game late in the year. It was Gold Coast round 22 up there. And um, I don't know, there was just this cloud come over me and, uh, you know, it was more about to have the conversation with my manager, um, Tom Petruro. So I, when I was up there, I messaged him. I literally said, mate, can we catch up Monday? I reckon we should start talking through things, um, whether I'm going to go again or not. And at that stage, I was going again. Like I was in the moment, yeah. you know, we're playing our best footy. I was playing my role, you know, what I needed to do off the field. And I was having so much fun. Um, so when I caught up with Tom, you know, we basically went through all that. I told him where I sat and he goes, well, yeah, that, that's all fine. But um, a little bit from him and, and the honesty that I asked for was, um, I reckon you've got 10 good games in you. And, and I sort of said, yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, prove you lot wrong like <laughs> yeah, I've proved everyone yeah. else wrong before. And, um, and with that, a sort of drove back to Geelong and, you know, I joined the dots, you know, basically said to him, yeah, if you can go back to the club and say that we're still interested, um, let's just talk it out later on. By the time that I got back to Geelong, I was out. You know, I just sort of, I just summed it up. There was also a moment where Harry Taylor come to me and I was stretching on the floor at the club and I'd get in there quite early to, you know, just look, look after myself and do those like lonely hours. And uh, he come up to me, he goes, oh, how are you going? And it, and he just basically, he was the one that was always going to give me the tap. Um, we we had a lot of teammates throughout the journey that we probably should have, you know, helped them out along the journey. But we always said to each other, when the time comes, just help each other out. So he came to me and uh, I was stretching and, I, and he basically said, just remember the time comes quickly. Um, and you're going well, but like, you know, enjoy what you're doing sort of didn't pick it up there. You know, I walked to the locker and he followed me again and he, he just re said the same thing again. And I said, oh, I reckon he's trying to tell me something here. Um, so th those two conversations helped that decision. Um, but I, I needed to tick off the third person, which was um, Steve Hocking, who had looked after me from that, you know, 20, age of 23. And uh, we had him around for dinner and it's the busiest week for the CEOs around 23 because all the clubs are still in the AFL, obviously, and playing. So all the CEOs come and they have their last meetings before, you know, 10 teams finish up and some go on holiday. So we got him down on a Thursday night and, you know, Britt knew what was going on, but it was like, let's, she cooks up her favorite deal because she wants me to go on <laughs> yeah. and play again. But um, we have him down and we basically, he's looking around the house. We just built a new house and is it. Uh, more in love with what was going on with the house. And I said, no, we didn't get you down for that. Like, what are we going to do? And he said, oh, well, what do you want to do? And I said, well, you know, and I, he said, what else do you need to do? And I said, oh, well, I just need to win it. And he said, well, is that it? And I said, well, I think so. And and with that, he sort of smiled and we had tears. And uh, and he's a hard man to bring tears to, but he, he sort of knew um, that it was a right, like, and, and he was, knew it was right to tell me that this is it. So go and enjoy it. Um, and I left it at that, you know, the next morning I went in and told the coach that I had the conversation with and that it was going to be the last time. And I w only wanted to know because I was playing down at GMHBA for the last game. So, um, which was, mate, it, 
it would, made, made it really special. I went in and told Scotty, and Scotty's across the list management stuff, and they've probably been speaking about me being in, um, but also been speaking about me being out. But I sort of hit him between the eyes and just said, oh, mate, you know, this is going to be it. You know, I'm out. Um, and he was like, he was a bit shocked by it because he didn't expect it that morning. Like it was 15 minutes before the main, Fine. like the main sort of captain's run meeting that he was going to congratulate Paddy on playing 300 games. And, um, you know, the same thing, you know, we had tears. So I went to leave his room, you know, it's a frosted window on his, uh, in his meeting room. And, um, I had to do the U-turn or as I did the U-turn, he sort of like had his hands, <laughs> you know, up to his head and you could tell that hit him pretty hard too. Um, so I knew then, and, uh, and a part of it was the decision was like, let's not tell anyone, um, from there, I'd sort of told a couple of people, um, and another girl that manages me, Catherine. Um, and then I sort of left it at that. Um, I told mum and dad the night before we went and played at GMHBA because I didn't want Brit sitting there by herself um, without them knowing that it was going to be it. And, and that was tough because they'd been in the AFL for 20 years yeah. um, with the twins going before me. So um, we literally basically, yeah, you know, we kept it to ourselves. And that last one at GMHBA Stadium, you know, I played with, you know, watery eyes the whole time, you know. Yeah. And not because I was sad, because I was just, mate, so happy that I got to call it work for so long. I was enjoying it. Um, played okay on the night. Kicked a couple of goals. Like I hadn't done that for a long time. <laughs> so it was a little bit like the weight was off. And I was yeah. glad that I did it then. So then I could sort of go into this final series and go, you know, just get to work. Like, Got nothing to lose. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, no, thanks for sharing. That's cool. I didn't write it long, sorry, yeah. mate. No, yeah, no, no, it was like, good because I, I I find it amazing that you kept it a secret for so long. The teammates are genuinely shocked when yeah. you – I think Jezza told me you told him when you were doing signing or when you'd won yeah. the flag. Like it was – you've done a great – you guys have all done a great job to keep it a secret, you know. Yeah. And sometimes – Well, it got to things, grand final day and sort of the game was what it was and throughout the third quarter, I think they probably got a bit bored and they're like, well, what could the story be? And yeah. I was lucky that Buddy and, you know, that was taking the headlines, is he going to retire or not? But when he signed up and said, I'll be back or something for next year, I was like, shit, this is going to move, <laughs> this is going to move the stick here. Yeah. I'm going to be in trouble. They're going to come, they're going to come for so, it. So, yeah. Oh. I sort of had a line that week. It was like, ah, uh, you know, I'd play any game like it was my last, yeah. whether it was a grand final or not. Like I've done it my whole career. Yeah. So I stuck with that. So I wasn't so much lying to the press, but it was like, you know, I, I sort of had it. Yeah. Sort of under control under anyway. Control. Um, back to that seat. Uh, so the grand final, the goal, mate. Talk me about the goal. And then I want to go back in the season about round three, about your, re your record breaking night as captain, but the goal. Like everyone goes, how yeah. did he do that, mate? Well, I hadn't done it before. <laughs> and I still don't know how it's sort of come about now, but um, I took a period off in the last quarter that was about seven minutes, which is a bit longer than usual. Um, again, you know, I'd, I was never anxious or, you know, I never got, you know, that far in the moment, but like my heart like started racing. It's like, I don't know, something up above knew that, like, mate, get your act together, you know, enjoy this last bit. And, you know, I was teary on the bench and um, Sam DeConing and Mark Blitzers picked it up and I was like, oh, I'm not hiding this this well <laughs> right now. Um, so when I come back on, it was like, yeah, I mean, I, I was finding the ball in the last quarter, but, you know, Guys like Mitch were looking out for me. They were guessing that it may be it. Um, didn't help that mum and um, Britt were up on this big screen a couple of times, you know, <laughs> with tears in their <laughs> eyes and uh, everyone was probably thinking along the same lines. But it sort of just, again, fell my way. Um, and, you know, again, if you, like I said before, if you hang in there long enough, then it might be all worth it. And, uh the goal is one that I sort of usually chip over in Hawks' direction, you know, for 16 years. Or Mitch Duncan's a kicker that, you know, I usually find him. I, you know, I knew that he was there, but I thought, I'm going to throw this on the checky. <laughs> and uh, off she went and she sailed through. Oh, I couldn't have hit it any more flush. Oh, it's beautiful, so, mate. It's a beautiful it's one, moment. It's, mate, it's one skill that I usually hit fat too. So it was just like. It fell perfectly, hit at the same time. That's so. all, mate, it's special, special yeah. moment. And um, one that, you know, brings a smile to every every footy fan, that moment, you know, you you just, like you see so many players playing their last game or whatever and, and you're trying to get them the ball and it doesn't work out yeah, and in yeah. your instance, it just, um, your situation, it just, it was a fairy tale finish. It was a beautiful finish and 
And then when you reflect as a fan, just watching good people do their thing, no one actually knew you were hanging up. So then you'd go back and if you watch it again, it's even more special. Um, going to the milestone game, you're gonna, there's a funny story with this, but this is also, I want to touch on the human element of you. You know, this is the stuff that you did. Record-breaking night, Stephen Kernahan's record for most games. Captain, you're breaking it, but you still take the time to write personalized messages, give it to one of your mates. You, you, you get a box for your friends and your dearest friend, uh, that, sorry, your family and your dearest friends, and you actually tell one of your mates, please read this out at half time. The, you know, a personalized note you wrote, which, which obviously said um, how special they all were to you and, and why they were in that room, which is beautiful touch. And then to be able to do that and also in the busiest week probably of your, you know, of your career sums up you as a human. Um, so well done on that. I think you, I think you, you tell your mates and your mates do say you make them look silly sometimes. You're that good of a human. <laughs> Um, You've done some good homework, Tommy, because <laughs> the, 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 um, yeah, the letter writing was one. Like it, it's a little bit notebookish um, <laughs> if you send a movie, but we literally um, we loved going to work with each other and fortunate to play like over 200 games with a lot of them. But, um, you know, it was one that just gives a personal touch more than anything else, I reckon, that if you take a time to time out to just write a letter and just let them know what they mean to you, then um, – you know, they they thoroughly enjoy it. So, and um, they did, mate. And they and th- that what they weren't enjoying was that the pies were up by thirty six <laughs> points with five to go in the third. And uh, there's a funny story off the back of it, which which as we want is a fairy tale night. A milestone man that's won hundred percent of games, mind you, with the research. <laughs> as I said, never lost a game in fifty, hundred, one fifty, two hundred, yep. two fifty, three hundred, three fifty, and even as the night when you're a skipper um, for the record. Jezza comes up to you at three quarter time and gives you a bit of a spray. Now I've got quite not spray, more just just he said the quote goes like this. Jezza runs up to Sal at three quarter time and said, "Just tell him to stop fucking around with it and just kick it to me and I'll win it off my own boot." Is that true or false? <laughs> it was literally true. So you know we weren't getting the job done in the midfield. So I got uh, a little bit like I got pushed to the forward line. Um, the week was big. Like I was as sick as a dog, but because of the everything that went into it, like organizing sticks and all that, like I had to go and play and I was like, I was no good. But there was a like the flow and effect of that. Like we just played poor and then it was like he just felt the moment and he's basically said, get me the fucking ball. <laughs> like, <laughs> and and we made a couple of changes. De Coney went forward, um, but literally it was like put in his area and uh, – and off he went. And uh, you, I got to play with a few special players like that, but that is one moment that I'll always remember, like uh, how he took over. He's, he wore the cape, you yeah. know, without wearing it. Yeah, so oh, mate, that, that he was makes, Superman. Me, makes me so happy listening to that. Um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good human, Jez, and he's a freakish athlete. I don't know how he does it. Um, and I'm glad that is true because <laughs> he, he doesn't. He wouldn't do that too much, but he obviously did feel the moment and then delivers, kicks three yeah. in the last, I think he kicks four in the last seven. Yeah. Um, mate, let's uh, – I want to do some quick fire, all right, because I yeah. know we've got to wrap up soon. Just going to go bang, bang, bang. All right, here we go. Most talented teammate you played with? Talented. Ablett. Toughest teammate you played with? Uh, Ling. Smartest footballer you played with? Ooh. Hawkins. Funniest teammate you ever played with? Oh, I've had a few. Give yeah. me the top two if you have to. Well, Jeremy's very clever. Uh, I giggle away at him. Uh, and then Hawk too. Most underrated player, someone that doesn't get talked about enough? Probably Brad Close. Teammate who has the best rig? Uh, I've had a few. Um, James Pods Yardley was a great the rig. Pod. I actually saw him playing golf last year. A team that you struggled to play against the most if you look back on your whole career? Maybe maybe Frio. I like that. <laughs> best, uh, best player you've ever played against in an opposing midfield? The one that I had most trouble with was Brett Kirk. Because he couldn't, couldn't go with Ablett. Bartel would go sort of forward or defender. Um, so he didn't really have that role. So he bashed me as a young kid. <laughs> <laughs> Kirky. What a, what, a, uh, what a man. If you could, if you could recruit one player to the, uh, in the competition that's currently playing at the moment to the Geelong Footy Club, who would it be and why? Oh, I think it's Kerno. Uh, he's just, 
is the sideshow that's going to be the next sort of five years to six years. Yep. Now that you're retired, what's the thing that you miss the most? The locker room. If you had to pick one of your ex-teammates to kick a goal after the siren, 40 metres out on a little bit of an angle, it's a grand final and the siren has sounded, who are you picking? Uh, I'm going to go three. I'm going to go Tom Hawkins, Jeremy Cameron. Oh, sorry, Tyson and Cam Guthrie can be even to last. There you go. Your personal uh, favourite Mad Monday outfit? Well, the old boys at the end was a good one. That was that, that was the slap to the, you know, <laughs> keeping them in the back of your mind. So that was a slap to those people that said, maybe they're just not good enough. Maybe yep. they're too old. Your uh, What's the best uh, Mad Monday outfit you've seen on a teammate? Uh well, Scarlett was big. Um, you know, even when he did Bartlett was, you know, a big effort. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and some advice to people playing finals football. What would you say to them out there? Because you are Mr. Finals. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I spoke to Werribee on the week. It, to be honest, it's, you simplify, you know, everything that you do and you've done the work. It's literally just trying to play your best brand of that for the year. Love it. Love it. Mate, thanks for the, the questions. Um, now we go to Rick's on tour to make a little, I've got one Let's more go. story before I give you some prizes. Um, <laughs> as always, mate, we gift some, some stuff at the end and uh, I've got the Soho cherries. Now these are just back in stock. We've sold out of these. These are yours, mate. I know you love Lovely. the spring carnival. So Soho cherries, anyone else out there that wants to look like Jolie, head online to rickseyewear.com.au and use the discount code go. ACES and you'll be looking as fresh Look as the that. great men. Uh, the Soho Cherries, mate, the Rick's on tour. Yeah. If you can please leave them on and tell me okay. who were the two players you're taking on tour with you and why? Uh, one is an ex-teammate, Dawson Simpson. Oh, uh, you, may, <laughs> you may have mixed with Dawson a little bit, but uh, he literally gets things done. Um, so I'm taking him anywhere and everywhere. Um, and then the big hawk, he... I can't guarantee that he'll step up for me, but uh, he, he'll give me the laughs along the way. That's brilliant. And where are you going with the, the big boys? Oh, to be honest, I actually wouldn't mind going for a camp. So it could be anywhere um, along the sort of east coast, I reckon, and uh, get the caravans and off we go. Love it. Oh, there'd be t there's no better blokes to go camping with, I'd imagine, especially if Dawson with his dog. I'll never, <laughs> never forget the video of his dog getting a beer out of the fridge. That <laughs> is um, that? That's special. And, mate, I've got some good news and bad news. You want the good news or the bad news first? Uh, let's go the good news. All right, we'll just go straight to the good news. The good news is Milwaukee Tools have re just released a brand new lawnmower and I couldn't get it in the building because it's so really? big, so it's not here. So you're not only going home with the Milwaukee Tools heated jacket that we gave Jezza before he kicked That's seven that did. night. I'm actually going to be gifting you and you're going to get this one in the mail. You're going to get an M18 dual battery lawnmower and a dual base starter pack. It's optimized, steel deck design. It's a push. Um, start and self properly I won't even say that push start it reaches full throttle in under a second and it comes with a starter pack to get you started so you're going home with a lawnmower mate so I hope you need to mow the lawns because Milwaukee Tools have just released uh, their brand new lawnmower and uh, that isn't in the building but it's coming your way Love that. and you get Spring. the heated jacket so let's stick to the heated jacket while it's in the building what is your Milwaukee Tools handiest moment of your footy career? There's a thousand, but you've got to pick one. Uh, the handiest moment. Um, like I was pretty hard on the boys, like <laughs> coming through. So I think um, just not allowing them to get away with the shortcuts, you know, training. Like oh, I literally would be on their backs, you know, the short to the cone, you know, early days. Uh, I remember giving Mitch Duncan like this – Thing and as you know, I won't take credit for his career, but I was like, if you think about even taking any shortcuts, you're not going to be half the player that you are. So, um, I'm glad he's gone on to play 270, 80 games for the Cats. That is a handy moment because he has been a superstar. Um, and if you think of a highlight, what would be the one highlight? You know, your handiest moment on the field. What would it be? Your Milwaukee tool um, handiest moment. Well. Uh, I I loved playing against my brothers um, and getting the wood on them. There's one game where I had Scott tagging me and then I had Adam. Um, so this was against West Coast over there, right in front of the bench. And the bench at Subiaco, as you know, was low. Like you get feedback pretty pretty quickly if you <laughs> want to. 
And I like I got away from Scott, um, and then Adam got me and crunched me. But um, I got up and gave him a push, um, and I, got, I ended up getting two grand for it for pushing an injured player. And I was like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it from the AFL. Like he literally sniped me more than anything else. But uh, the feedback that I got from the Eagles fans that night was uh, probably my handiest. Oh, there you go. That's that's special, mate. Well, um. That's all I've got. I just want to say a massive thank you. It's been a pleasure to sit down and have a chat. Um, you've inspired so many and uh, you're doing some great things off the field. We'll do this again when we've got another um, two hours. But uh, I just want to say thank you for coming on. Mr. Football, Mr. September, <laughs> we've got you on Tommy Talks in finals period. I, I can't thank you enough. Um, before we go, I just want you to ask our listeners, you know, I didn't get to talk about leadership and all that. Yep. What would be the one thing you'd ask all the listeners to look themselves in the mirror to get better? What's something that you ask of people when you do your leadership consultant work? What's one thing we can leave the listeners with? Oh, so basically just if you want to do it, then don't ask others, others to do it. So, um, I, I just love the relationship side of, um, working with a team. So I learned so much out of, you know, everyone we speak about Ty- Tyson Stengel before, like I only spent a year with him, but I learned so much about life um, from him. So where you don't think you can learn, you can still learn. There you go. Brilliant. Thanks so much, mate. Good I appreciate work, it. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tommy Talks, where you literally can't thank you enough for all your support. Righto. We'll see you on the next podcast. Lead the charge with Milwaukee. Performance, power, precision, no petrol hassles. Learn more at milwaukeetool.com.au. Milwaukee, nothing but heavy duty. Attention sports fans, planning an overseas trip to catch your favorite games? Look no further than sports where I am. They've got it all. League schedules, trustworthy tickets, and over 200 cities to choose from, all conveniently on one website. Plus, as an Australian company, They know the importance of great customer service for those long-haul journeys. So visit sportswhereiam.com and start planning your dream sports trip today. Sports Where I Am, your ticket to an unforgettable sports travel experience.